Good morning. The Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife will come to order. This subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on H.R. 2245, the Cecil Act. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at the hearing are limited to the chairman and the ranking member, the vice chair and the vice ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and helps members keep their schedule. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the subcommittee clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, one other bit of housekeeping. I'm told that votes are expected in about 30 minutes. So that will interrupt our hearing this morning. We will uh, recess uh, for those votes, and then we will come back as soon as we can get that vote series finished. So I apologize for the inconvenience, but sometimes that's the way we have to do th things around here. All right. Well, good morning. Thanks to everyone for joining us to discuss uh, international trophy hunting today. Trophy hunting, needless to say, can be an incredibly divisive issue. For many Americans, it can be deeply disturbing to see photos of hunters posing with slain lions, elephants, or other charismatic animals. Many believe that exotic animal trophy hunting, typically done by extremely wealthy individuals, is different in character than the responsible, sustainable hunting and angling traditions that are so widely embraced in our country. Even within the sportsman's community, trophy hunting elicits mixed feelings, especially the practice of trophy hunting for vulnerable and threatened wildlife species that are facing extinction. Yet that is often the most sought after thrill for trophy hunters who pay five or six figures to kill vulnerable and threatened animals like lions. Trophy hunters claim that by paying those large amounts of money that ostensibly goes towards conservation, they're actually helping the endangered animals that they kill. Whether that brand of pay-to-kill conservation actually works is debatable. It's something we'll examine more closely today as we discuss Chairman Grijalva's bill, the Conserving Ecosystems by Ceasing the Importation of Large Animal Trophies Act, or the Cecil Act for short. It is named, of course, for the lion killed in Zimbabwe in 2015 by an American trophy hunter. The Cecil Act would protect species from trophy hunting import licensing at the time that they are proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act, and this is to prevent a rush to hunt those proposed species. It would require that the Fish and Wildlife Service go back and analyze with input from the public whether trophy imports to the U.S. actually enhanced the conservation of the species in the country where they were hunted. This is the claim trophy hunters make, so let's verify it. And let's make sure the appropriate political and conservation safeguards are in place before allowing importation of endangered and threatened animal trophies. If trophy hunters want their hunts to actually support conservation, they should support this to make sure their community and U.S. wildlife officials are not being bamboozled by corrupt operators or lax practices in these countries. In addition to requiring these safeguards, the bill directs the GAO to determine whether trophy hunting in foreign countries actually contributes to wildlife conservation. It asks the GAO for recommendations for reforms to the industry. This is important to make sure our policy decisions are based on facts, not wishful narratives. The need for at least some reforms seems obvious. Right now, the cost of a permit to import a threatened or endangered animal trophy is $100. That fee covers 8% of the cost of the permit program at the Fish and Wildlife Service. The rest is subsidized, a gift from U.S. taxpayers to trophy hunters who can afford to pay tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to hunt an animal in another country. Now, even if you support having a program for millionaires and billionaires to experience the thrill of killing a lion and hanging it on their wall, most people would agree the taxpayers should not be subsidizing 92% of the cost. The Cecil Act would change that. Of course, in the current administration, the National Rifle Association calls the shots on these matters. At the NRA's bidding, the Trump administration has made trophy hunting much easier without any of the proper oversight one would expect if you actually cared about threatened species. In fact, the administration has revoked an Obama-era rule that bars the import of animal trophies from certain African countries, and the Fish and Wildlife Service is now examining these trophy imports on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Not only has the administration loosened trophy hunting standards in a way that weakens protections under the ESA, they've also created a sham advisory committee, the so-called International Wildlife Conservation Council, whose mission explicitly requires it to promote trophy hunting. And they packed the council with trophy hunting enthusiasts, NRA representatives, celebrated trophy hunters, and advocates from trophy hunting organizations. Guess who isn't on the advisory committee? Wildlife biologists. Clearly, the administration doesn't consider itself bound by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which requires that committees like this be, quote, fairly balanced uh, in terms of the points of view represented, and, quote, not be inappropriately influenced by the appointing authority or any special interest. Yeah, the law requires that. The Cecil Act would eliminate the sham advisory committee. For those who say trophy hunting promotes conservation, let's at least make sure it's done right. With peer-reviewed science, through oversight to prevent corruption or harm to local communities, and above all, with conservation in mind. That, in a nutshell, is what the Cecil Act does. If we're going to have a government-sanctioned program for importing endangered animal trophies, we have the responsibility to make sure that hunting is conducted in an honest, verifiable, sustainable, and ethical way. The Cecil Act takes important steps in that direction. With that, I will turn it over to the ranking member for his opening comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we meet today to consider H.R. 2245 that attempts to severely constrict the importation of animal trophies in an attempt to discourage trophy hunting. As we will hear from the nations directly affected, the practical effect of the bill will remove the incentives to preserve endangered species on the African continent. Now, I have a confession to make. I am not a hunter. I don't understand its appeal. I never have. This isn't a moral judgment. I, I don't understand the appeal of stamp collecting either. It's just not my thing. And as a consumer, I happen to really enjoy steak and hamburgers, but I don't think I could ever slaughter a cow. I'm awfully glad, however, that there are others who can and regularly do. In fact, we slaughter 39 million cows and calves in this country every year. They should be on the endangered species list because at this rate, cows should be extinct in this country by next year. Yet we never seem to run out of cows and calves. And that's because they have value. And that value is what provides the incentive to breed them and care for them. The danger occurs when we run afoul of what economists call the tragedy of the commons. If no one owns them, then everyone has a perverse incentive to overuse them. In those cases, regulation becomes an important part of sustainability. Too many takings and the species can become threatened with extinction. But also, too few takings can doom a species to morbid overcrowding and overpopulation, which nature then regulates quite brutally through disease, starvation, and mass die-offs. My concern with this bill is that it doesn't make these distinctions. I understand the passions behind it, but as Benjamin Franklin warned, passion governs, but she never governs wisely. So in this case, I wish we'd pay attention to the governments of Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and the other African nations in whose affairs we are meddling. As they will tell us, they highly depend upon healthy animal populations for a significant part of their economic development and re revenues. They have every incentive to protect these populations and have extensive programs to do so. As they will tell us, regulated trophy hunting is a central part of that equation and a major source of the incentives and revenues they need to maintain these populations. If we collapse trophy hunting, we destroy the very incentives and revenues that underpin their conservation efforts. Trophy hunting places a high value on these animals, incentivizing landowners and governments to maintain the habitats necessary to support healthy populations so that they can be harvested. If we collapse trophy hunting, there's no incentive to maintain these habitats. Trophy hunting produces major revenues for these governments to support their conservation programs. This bill would cut off those revenues. Where trophy hunting is legal and regulated, the incentives to combat illegal poaching are immense. Illegal poaching is a direct threat to the commerce generated by legal hunting. If we collapse legal hunting, the economic incentive to combat illegal poaching collapses along with it. Because trophy hunting is legal, it can be monitored and regulated to assure the sustainable management of these populations for all time. 
If we make the trade of trophies illegal, we forfeit our ability to regulate this trade and instead give it to the underground market. At the same time, we promote poaching as a more viable alternative to regulated and licensed takings. The colonial attitude toward Africa has always been that we in the West know better than the African nations of what's good for them. On that basis, the American left has sought to deny them cheap energy sources necessary to lift them out of poverty, and on that basis, it would catastrophically disrupt the extensive African conservation practices that are contributing to a sustainable development of their natural resources. Mr. Chairman, please listen to and respect the government of Zimbabwe, speaking for 23 African nations that depend on hunting for their conservation programs and their economic development, when that government tells us, quote, progressive countries like the United States are expected to play a leading role in promoting activities that benefit conservation and humanity rather than enacting laws that will prejudice other sovereign countries like Zimbabwe of our benefits from good conservation practices. When we do well in conserving wildlife, we do not expect to receive penalties and punishments from our most important trade partner, the USA. Don't you think that by enacting the proposed Cecil Act, which is based on unrealistic and philosophical ideologies, is disempowering governments and local communities? Indeed, that will be another form of violating our human rights. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to note the presence in the audience of Sylvester Muchila, uh, who is here uh, representing the Republic of Namibia, uh, 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 who will, uh, I believe holds uh, views similar to those that will be uh, discussed by the representative from the government of Zimbabwe. I'd also ask unanimous consent that our uh, colleagues, the Dean of the House, the Honorable Gentleman from the great state of Alaska, Congressman Don Young, as well as the gentleman from Georgia, Congressman Austin Scott, be allowed to sit uh, with the subcommittee and participate in the hearing. Without objection, and welcome, sir, to our, to our subcommittee. We will now begin our testimony starting with the sponsor of the Cecil Act, uh, Chairman Raul Grijalva. Chair Grijalva, thanks for being here today. The next five minutes is yours. Thank you, and good morning uh, to everyone, and uh, to you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Chairman Hoffman. I appreciate uh, this hearing very much and uh, all the work that uh, this committee, this subcommittee has done in terms of uh, bringing, bringing up very, very good legislation, and uh, I appreciate your work and the work of the staff. Um, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking because I, I called home yesterday, Mr. Chairman, to talk to my grandbabies uh, about going to see Lion King, you know, because it, uh, it premieres tonight at midnight, and uh, I have to, have to tell you and your staff this impeccable timing, by the way. Uh, and I said, you know what, wait for me. I'm, I think we're going to get a break, and we'll go see the movie together. Uh, they wouldn't wait. And so... I guess I'm going to see that one by myself. It's The Lion King, Beyonce, her beehive. Uh, I, I may, uh, you know, I mentioned that, Mr. Chairman, because I think it, I may suggest that uh, to the opponents of the Cecil Act, uh, like the NRA, that it would behoove them uh, with its declining uh, membership, with its brutal internal strife that's going on, and litigation, and with its declining revenue, that on this particular issue that the American people overwhelmingly support, and, uh, and even more so in the near future, that they tread lightly. And to the Safari Club International, who uh, uh, the, one of their former principal lobbyists is now uh, Secretary of Interior, I would suggest to them that they tread lightly as well. Uh, it's not just about public opinion, but we worked hard on this piece of legislation, and we invited the Department of Interior to testify on this bill that they declined the invitation. One can, you know, one can conjecture some reasons for that denial, but uh, maybe it's in a very rare occasion where I can say I agree with the guy uh, that when the president called uh, trophy hunting uh, a horror show, uh, maybe they disagree with that position of the and perhaps uh, NRA and, and Sierra Club Interna Safari Club International, uh, the, their foundation, uh, one of the biggest, both big proponents, uh, felt that it wasn't appropriate for Interior to be here and to give testimony to this committee. When I introduced the first Cecil Act in 2015, uh, at, at the time, lions were only proposed to be listed under the Endangered Species 
facts. So there was no policies in place to ban the importation of lion trophies to the United States. So we had a situation where the science was saying lions are in trouble and in need of protection, but our policies and regulations were lagging to say the least. So that bill banned trophy imports of species that are proposed to be listed. That is the, different, the change while the rule is being finalized. In addition, uh, after CISA was killed, the committee published a report, uh, uh, minority at that time, to assess the impacts of trophy hunting on efforts to conserve threatened and endangered wildlife in some African countries. The report found that while it was possible for a sport hunted trophy import to meet the Endangered Species Act standards to enhance the species, the bar needs to be set higher. Regulatory loopholes exist, trophy import fees are far too low, and more needs to be done to ensure that trophy hunting does benefit conservation. After our report was released uh, and uh, Donald Trump became the president, rather than taking those recommendations for any kind of consideration, it came in no surprise that the administration put forward a number of new harmful policies. So we went back to the drafting table and the version of the CECIL Act and based on findings of the report and seeks to right many of the wrongs of this administration. The administration's policy on trophy hunting are representational of an overarching foundational problem we have seen from this administration. Not only is it another handout to the NRA, they are anti-science and benefit the extremely rich and the, to the detriment of most of Americans who care about wildlife. You know, uh, if uh, science has suddenly become an ideology, I will plead guilty. Uh, I know we all hear claims today that trophy hunting benefits conservation. Uh, let me be clear, pulling a trigger I don't think equals conservation. And if those folks claim trophy hunting can actually lead to positive conservation outcomes, okay, let's qualify and quantify what those outcomes are, including the political and scientific frameworks that make conservation successful. That's the core of the CECIL Act, simple as that. If we're going to do any trophy hunting, we've got to use the highest standard to ensure that we are protecting threatened and endangered species. With that, uh, thank you very much for, for, uh, for the hearing, Mr. Chairman Huffman, and I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva. I will now uh, introduce our witnesses for the panel today. Our first witness is Ms. Iris Ho. She is the Wildlife Program Manager at Humane Society International. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Craig Packer, Professor and Director of Lion Research at the University of Minnesota. Following him will be Ms. Ellie Pepper, the Deputy Director of Wildlife Trade at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Next, coming all the way from the University of Queensland, we have Dr. Mucha Makono. I hope I got that right, Doctor, uh, who is a research fellow there. Thank you. Uh, then we'll hear from Ms. Catherine Semser, a research fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center. Finally, from the government of Zimbabwe, we will hear from Ms. Patience Gandiwa, who is the Executive Technical Advisor of the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. Let me remind all the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes. When you begin your testimony, uh, there will be a uh, green light at the one minute point. It will turn yellow to uh, give you a cue that it's time to begin wrapping up. And when your five minutes has expired, there'll be a red light and I will ask you uh, to conclude. Um, don't worry if you can't get your entire statement in. The entire written statement you've submitted will appear as part of the hearing record. And uh, I will also allow the entire panel to testify before we bring it back to the members for their questions. So with that, the chair now recognizes Ms. Ho for her testimony. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Huffman and committee members. My name is Iris Ho, representing the Humane Society of the United States, Humane Society International, and the Humane Society Legislative Fund. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HR 2245, the CISO Act, my gratitude also goes to Chairman Grahava for introducing this important legislation. Four years ago this month, CISO was lured out of Huangi National Park, shot by an American hunter with an arrow, suffering 10 agonizing hours before the hunter finished him off the next day. Adding insult to injury, two years later, CISO's oldest son, Zanda, was also killed by a hunter, not far from where CISO was killed. 
CISO was a beloved international icon and generated revenues for the local tourism industry. Both lions were vital components to Oxford University's studies, and let's not forget, both were fathers. While the trophy hunting industry attempted to quickly draw away from CISO's killer and the circumstances surrounding it, CISO and Zanda's high-profile killings epitomized the true nature of the trophy hunting industry, one that encourages killing rare animals, ignores science, tramples on conservation, disregards wildlife laws, and fuels corruption and wildlife trafficking. Hunting quotas are often overshot, not based on science. They lack independent reviews. Age limitations are not enforced. Hunting regulations are flouted. Trophy hunters don't kill for conservation. They kill for bragging rights, for fun, and for obtaining an animal trophy to display their conquest at home. There's irrefutable scientific evidence that trophy hunting has contributed to substantial declines in lion and leopard populations across Africa and have put these species in danger of extinction. Deliberate removals of animals by trophy hunters have cascading effects by disrupting social cohesion and population stability. It also magnifies human-wildlife conflict. When older bull elephants in bachelor groups or the male head of the lion pride are removed, the young males have become more aggressive, resulting in increased likelihood of infanticide and starvation in lion prides and attacks from both to livestock, agriculture, and humans. Animals are not the only ones that lose in the trophy hunting enterprise. Locals will pay price if key wildlife disappears. Non-consumptive tourism, such as wildlife viewing safaris, contribute significantly much more sustainable and substantial than trophy hunting, and they also generate more jobs. Trophy hunting contributes to just 0.0% of the annual GDP of the eight countries surveyed in 2017, supporting only 7,500 jobs. To put this in perspective, a recent report puts non-consumptive tourism supporting 24 million jobs, generating $48 billion ex expenditures for African protected areas. By killing majestic animals for a one-time trophy fee, hunting cripples current and future tourism industries and harming economic opportunities potentials for the local communities. A few years ago, I visited a Chinese official urging his government to ban the commercial trade in elephant ivory. He listened to me, smiled, and asked me, how about you Americans stop hunting elephants first? I was embarrassed. It really is up to us to stop contributing to the problems that we are trying to and demanding others to fix. The U.S. spends billions of dollars annually on foreign aid to help fragile democracies strengthen rule of law and governance, while American trophy hunters bolster an industry notorious for corruption. It is not just the survival of the species at stake here, but also our standing as a global leader. Closer to home, trophy hunting is increasingly disdained by young Africans and Americans alike. A U.S. poll indicates that 80% of respondents oppose importing lion and hunting trophies into the U.S., and 80% of Republican respondents also opposed. Young Africans shared this sentiment where one person once commented to me, when foreign hunters leave, Africa is left with empty forests and bones. Dear committee members, this is not a partisan issue. It is time that we rid the United States of the disgraceful reputations as the world's most prolific trophy hunters. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Dr. Packer for five minutes. Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member McClintock, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. It is a great honor to, hear, to appear before you to share my experience as director of the Lyon Research Center at the University of Minnesota. I have worked in Africa for over 40 years. My research directly led to changes in wildlife policy that imposed an age minimum for lion trophies in Botswana, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. 
I represented the United Republic of Tanzania as part of their delegation to CITES in 2004, and I was also asked by the Tanzanian government to analyze their CITES records so as to measure the impacts of past hunting practices on lion offtakes. I assembled most of the data on lion population status across Africa that led to the current red list status of lions at IUCN, and I advised U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service during their deliberations to list the African lion as threatened or endangered. Much of Africa's wildlife estate has long been the purview of the sport hunting industry. However, there continues to be a dramatic loss in wildlife numbers across the continent. While sport hunting was seen as the best way to protect the lesser visited areas, hunting revenues have not succeeded in protecting elephants, giraffe, rhinos, cheetahs, or lions, all of which have suffered enormous losses in the third, past 30 years. But this is not to say that sport hunting should be banned. It is in desperate need of reform. Sport hunting has been demonstrably successful in protecting wildlife in the community conservancies of Namibia, in privately run wildlife reserves in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Botswana's hunting ban in 2014 was ill-advised and counterproductive and has recently been reversed. But in Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zambia, the government-run hunting reserves have been poorly managed. And currently, at least a sixth and as many as a half of the hunting blocks in these countries remain unclaimed with the risk that the land will be removed from the wildlife estate as there is no alternative to sport hunting in these areas. The overarching challenge of relying on sport hunting as a tool for conservation is the lack of real and sustainable revenue. The costs of effective lion conservation are between one and $2,000 per square kilometer per year, whereas trophy fees for lions are less than $25,000 per animal, and the hunter only pays if his hunt is successful. Thus, Tanzania, for example, needs to raise at least $300 to $600 million a year in hunting revenues that goes to the government to cover the operation costs of conserving their hunting blocks. Yet fewer than 100 lions are harvested every year, and the overall shortfall in hunting revenue is between a quarter and half a billion dollars every year. The fees for all the most important trophy species like lions, elephants, leopards, and Cape buffalo should be significantly increased, perhaps by as much as six-fold to even come close to covering the costs of protecting their natural habitat. Thus, while sport hunting has indeed provided some much-needed funding to conserve a few selected areas, it is not enough to protect vast swaths of wildlife habitat. About a million square kilometers of lion habitat still exist across all of Africa, but more and more hunting blocks are lying unclaimed, and the growing demands of a rapidly expanding human population will soon be overwhelming. By the year 2050, human population densities in sub-Saharan Africa will be the same as in India today. Similarly, opponents of sport hunting have offered no alternative mechanism for raising the necessary funding to protect these areas. New approaches are urgently needed. As to the specifics of H.R. 2245, several aspects of the bill make good sense. The requirement for transparency and clear evidence of positive conservation impacts from sport hunting are long overdue and should be welcomed by conservationists and sport hunters alike. However, I have concerns about Section 3.4, which may not allow the possibility of reform in Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Without meaningful incentives to reform, these countries could well lose even more wildlife habitat. The U.S. government has few levers to pull, and a permanent ban would remove one of them. We need for all hunters and conservationists to work together to protect these species and their habitat. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pecker. The uh, chair now rep recognizes Ms. Pepper for five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the CECL Act. My name is Ellie Pepper, and I'm the Deputy Director of International Wildlife Conservation for the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC. NRDC is a national nonprofit environmental organization with more than 3 million members and online activists working to protect the world's natural resources, public health, and environment. The CECL Act's requirements are critically needed and long overdue. When trophy hunting began, wildlife was seemingly plentiful, and we were unaware of the threats it would face in the future. Today, we know from sources like the recently released IPBIS report that one million species face extinction due to human actions. 
One of the top drivers of this extinction crisis is direct exploitation, which includes trophy hunting and the, inter and the international wildlife trade. In this context, trophy hunting of species threatened with extinction is ludicrous. Even more perplexing is that amidst this biodiversity crisis, the administration created an advisory committee to promote the antithesis of sound conservation policy and strike at the heart of the Fish and Wildlife Service's mission to conserve, protect, and enhance wildlife for the American people. The International Wildlife Conservation Council, or IWCC, was formed in 2017 to advise the Secretary solely on the benefits of international hunting. Similarly, the Council's charter instructs it to recommend ways to reduce protections for international species under the Endangered Species Act and CITES, no matter the circumstances, undermining the service's congressional mandate to protect species under these mechanisms and base conservations on science. The IWCC's pro-hunting mission also contravenes the public interest in sound wildlife conservation. Americans care deeply about wildlife, as shown by the public outcry when Cecil the lion was killed by a trophy hunter and when President Trump removed elephant import restrictions for Zambia and Zimbabwe. Also, a 2015 survey found that 86% of Americans, 75% of gun owners, and 65% of hunters oppose big game trophy hunting. The IWCC's membership is also very unbalanced. While conservation groups nominated staff to the IWCC, the Interior Department rejected them in favor of 18 advocates for trophy hunting, firearms, and exotic animal imports. For example, eight council members are connected to pro-hunting groups and six are connected to firearms manufacturers or the NRA. One of the council's members is also a registered NRA lobbyist, despite the service's prohibition on lobbyists serving on advisory committees. If this weren't troublesome enough, the council's charter lacks provisions to moderate the influence of hunting interests on the council. For example, John Jackson, president of Conservation Force, participated in a council discussion on lifting the suspension of Tanzanian lion trophy imports, even though he routinely import, uh, submits import permit applications. These issues are compounded by the IWCC's lack of transparency. Several meetings have not provided the required 15-day notice. The IWCC has prevented members of the public from addressing the committee and failed to produce documents prior to the meetings. The council and its subcommittees have also met in secret. To top it all off, the IWCC is illegal under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA, which is why we've sued to end it. FACA was enacted to curb the executive branch's reliance on secretive advisory committees, which special interests were using to drive federal decision-making outside public scrutiny. FACA requires that federal advisory committees be in the public interest, fairly balanced among competing points of view, and structured to avoid inappropriate influence by special interests. They must also make their pub meetings public and disclose all meeting documents. As explained, the IWCC flagrantly violates these requirements. The administration recently issued an executive order requiring agencies to terminate at least one-third of their advisory councils in situations including where the cost exceeds the benefits. The IWCC's budget of $250,000 per year far outweighs its benefits, which are precisely zero. This sham council has now existed for 18 months, but has yet to produce a single recommendation, at least not one that has been disclosed to the public. We would encourage the administration to use the CEO to disband the IWCC immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pepper. The chair now uh, recognizes Dr. McCono for five minutes. Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you on a subject which has significant implications for the conservation of charismatic megafauna in Africa, many of which are now threatened with extinction. To illustrate, a century ago, there were more than 200,000 lions in the African wild. The number has fallen to around 20,000, a reduction of 90% in that short space of time. Clearly, something is not working. Trophy hunting has not stopped the sharp decline in populations. About three years ago, as part of my research, I visited Wange National Park, where Cecil lived before he was brutally killed by Walter Palmer on July 1, 2015. I was heartbroken to learn that as of that year, the only six surviving rhinos at the park had been moved to a 24-hour guarded conservancy there were none left there for visitors to see, zero. I asked how this could be the case when hunting occurring in adjacent conservancies was supposed to be working for conservation of endangered species. The answer I got was what we have always known, 
the trophy hunting system is corrupt. The money ends up in the pockets of a powerful few. Very, very little is channeled back to conservation. The truth is that trophy hunting is a rich boys club that is of little benefit to wildlife and local rural communities. A 2013 report by economists at large reveals that communities receive only about 3% of the gross revenue from trophy hunting. During my fieldwork, when I was talking to people in the rural district of Wange, they reported earning no more than $3 per household in income per year from the proceeds of hunting. In a few cases, hunting revenues have funded the purchase of a communal grinding mill or the drilling of a borehole. But such cases are the exception, certainly not the norm. And even then, the benefits are token, to put it mildly, and the surrounding communities continue to live in abject poverty, despite decades of state-sanctioned hunting happening in their vicinity. It is incumbent on all of us who care about these majestic animals, lions, elef elephants, and others, to demand better from the relevant authorities. I believe the Cecil Act will help to send this message clearly. These beautiful animals are worth more alive than dead. I think of all the busloads of tourists who would have enjoyed seeing the charismatic Cecil at Wange National Park to this day, had his life not been cut short. He should have had the opportunity to thrive for many more years and sire more offspring as nature intended. If megafauna should be killed in the name of conservation, at the very least, there must be, a clear, and con there must be clear and convincing evidence that the revenues will go towards tangible conservation outcomes. I regret very much the recent decision by President Masisi of Botswana to reverse the ban on hunting that was instituted by his predecessor, President Kama. We know that hunters often flout the relevant codes of conduct and regulations. They use baits to lure animals out of non-hunting protected zones. They shoot animals that fall below the required, required age threshold. Quarters are not always adhered to due, due to greed and corruption. And when they are caught doing the wrong thing, Hunters go scot-free for many reasons. I put to you that the image of conservation is not of a proud hunter squatting next to his trophy, a dead lion or rhino or giraffe. Conservation entails the work of organizations such as Akashinga, who are working day and night to protect animals from poaching. Organizations that fund wildlife research, training rangers, ensuring that animals have access to water when there are droughts, communities, investing in teaching young people to value wildlife, working to ensure that migration corridors for wildlife are restored. That, I submit to you, is conservation. The importance of moving away from hunting goes beyond the economic benefits from non-consumptive wildlife approaches. It is also about fostering a culture of respect and care for these majestic animals. My final words are this. When visiting Africa, bring a camera, not a gun. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. McConnell. Ms. Semser, you're recognized for five minutes. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McClintock, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Catherine Semser, and I am a research fellow with the Property and Environment Research Center, a conservation research institute based in Bozeman, Montana. PERC has a 40-year history of exploring market-based solutions to conservation challenges. In the decades since many African states won their independence, trophy hunting has shown itself to be an effective market-based tool to raise revenue and create economic incentives for wildlife conservation. This effectiveness is internationally recognized by respected agencies and institutions, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.N. Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Bank, and the International Union for Conservation of Nature. As part of holistic conservation programs, trophy hunting enables African nations to practice conservation at landscape scales while improving the lives and livelihoods of rural people in a way that reduces dependence on foreign aid and philanthropy and helps achieve the U.S. foreign policy goal of Africa, African economies that thrive, 
prosper, and control their own destinies. Recent U.S. restrictions on the importation of certain hunting trophies have had negative consequences for the shared goals of the United States and its African partners. Enshrining and expanding such bans in law risks having these negative consequences metastasize over a significantly wider area, especially if no economically viable alternatives to trophy hunting are present or provided. For these reasons, Congress should avoid taking any action that would undermine the ability of America's African partners to utilize trophy hunting as part of their conservation programs. Africa is one of the world's fastest growing regions. By 2050, Africa is projected to account for half of the world's population growth. And by 2100, it is predicted to be the birthplace of one out of every three people. Sub-Saharan Africa is home to six of the world's 10 fastest growing economies, with the World Bank forecasting regional GDP growth of 3.4% this year and as much as 3.7% in 2020, 2021. Africa's middle class has anticipated to grow from 245 million to 380 million over the next decade. The rise of the continent's middle class will be integrated with increased urbanization, with the number of cities with populations exceeding 5 million expected to triple to 17 in the same 10 years. African economies should grow and prosper. However, increased demands for goods, services, and infrastructure will undoubtedly accompany this growth, with a likely increase in stress on African ecosystems. This stress is already being witnessed with increased energy and transportation infrastructure development in national parks and other conservation areas in Kenya, Guinea, and Tanzania. The conservation of important areas of habitat, even in national parks where phototourism is the dominant wildlife use, can no longer be taken for granted to the degree it once was. This reality should be front and center in the policymaking process, and the policies of the United States should seek to maximize the reduction of barriers to habitat conservation in Africa, especially through market-based approaches capable of making conservation economically competitive with other land uses. The trophy hunting programs of African nations have a demonstrated track record of making wildlife habitat an economically competitive land use and preventing conversion to agriculture. These programs currently conserve near, nearly 350 million acres of habitat, a figure that exceeds the total area of Sub-Sahara Africa's national parks by 22%. The areas conserved are generally marginal, and while ecologically important, lack the characteristics necessary for them to be economically viable as phototourism areas. Trophy hunting programs create economic incentives for habitat conservation via revenue sharing programs with rural and indigenous communities, encouragement of nature-based entrepreneurship, rural job creation, and increases in food security. They are also responsible for the significant growth in populations of species such as the southern white rhino and the African elephant in countries like South Africa and Zimbabwe. Negative consequences of bans on trophy hunting and the importation of hunting trophies into the United States have met with severe negative consequences. This includes reported national level wildlife declines of as much as 88% and the dissolution of anti-poaching patrols that were funded with trophy hunting revenues. The increased barriers and restrictions the Cecil Act will place on US participation in African trophy hunting markets can only be expected to allow these kinds of negative impacts to increase and expand in scale and intensity. For this reason, the Cecil Act, as written, will likely fail at accomplishing the shared goals of the United States and its African partners. And we recommend that Congress develop and pursue an alternative policy course. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Semser. Chair now recognizes Dr. Gandiwa for five minutes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for inviting Zimbabwe to also give its perspectives on this uh, bill. The government of Zimbabwe is grateful for this opportunity that we have availed us to share our perspectives on the CISO Act. We are deeply concerned about this bill as it is based on misleading ideas from those who are presumably doing conservation based on theory and not in practice. Zimbabwe has the second largest population of African elephant in the whole world and a growing population of African lion, which is an apex predator on top of this African savanna ecosystem. Trophy hunting is an important revenue stream for our conservation efforts in an area constituting more than 26% of Zimbabwe's total land area, both inside and outside the protected areas. Impacts, which is the 
body that is mandated for conservation of wildlife in Zimbabwe is not funded by the national fiscus since 2001 and have therefore self-reliant. Significant losses were incurred by Zimbabwe after 2014 when the US government enforced stricter domestic measures on the importation of sport hunted trophies of lion and elephant, from over five million down to less than two million. Yet the costs of conserving these species are actually increasing, including the loss of human life through human wildlife conflicts and battles with transnational organized crime. The bill jeopardizes the effective implementation of our strategic plan. I brought a copy with me here. Our national elephant management plan, our lion strategic management plan, to mention a few. Without resources from the sustainable utilization of our wildlife, achievement of these conservation targets becomes a challenging issue, even for several other species as well. The proposed bill is not crafted in the spirit of advancing conservation efforts at grassroots level and is not in sync with the sound conservation policies of the range states concerned and the aspirations of the people living with such wildlife species. It is introducing fortress conservation principles which remove the economic value of the wildlife from the local people and governments. The bill also is an impediment to the basic human rights and sustainable development agenda depriving our rural communities from the legal benefits of sustainable wildlife utilization under our campfire program. Elephants and lions and other wildlife species are important ecological, cultural, aesthetic, economic assets for rural Africa. Wildlife-based initiatives from Southern Africa have demonstrated that sustainable utilization of these resources contributes significantly to habitat conservation and poverty alleviation and the government of Zimbabwe is desirous to grow a wildlife-based economy. As far as the alleged colonialism or neo-colonialism claims are concerned, that has never been the case uh, with our country and in Southern Africa. The United States of America and the supportive hunting community in USA have never been a colonial power in Zimbabwe, and such utterances are baseless and have no truth in them. However, the name of the bill itself it leaves a lot to be desired if it is really an inspiration from the story of Sisu the lion from Wange National Park in Zimbabwe. We are aware that it has been made a famous lion in several media houses by those who are not making any meaningful contribution to the conservation of lions in Zimbabwe, making fortunes in millions of dollars for themselves. For the local people, it, is, it was just an ordinary adult lion. And it was not famous at all. Probably it was famous just to the researchers who were studying it. It is not in our culture from Zimbabwe anyway to give names to wildlife and personifying them like human beings. It's actually the other way around because we believe in having totems. Human beings can actually have the totem, name of an animal, not the other, not an animal having a name of a human being. This is what we know is in Zimbabwe's history, Sisu John Rhodes, who was an imperialist. Even under this, the Convention of, on International Trade in Endangered Species, the range states is acknowledged that the range states of the species concerned are the and should be the best protectors of their own wildlife. And CITES recognizes that well-managed and sustainable trophy hunting is consistent and contributes to the species conservation as it provides both livelihood opportunities for rural communities and incentives for habitat conservation and generates the benefits that can be invested for conservation purposes. It is a proven fact that it, the economic, where the economic value can be attached to wildlife and a controlled management system is implemented. Favorable conditions for, can be created for investments and the conservation and sustainable use of the resource. Our people should benefit from the wildlife resources through utilization of both consumptive and non-consumptive tourism. There is no panacea or one-size-fits-all approach. There are limitations to what non-consumptive tourism can actually offer. We strongly believe in a holistic approach to conservation of these iconic species, and trophy hunting should remain in the toolbox of options of and at our disposal and generating the much-needed revenue. Reducing our donor dependence in ho with homegrown sustainable. Dr. Kandiwa, well, I'll ask you to please wrap up if you could. Thank you. And we need to secure habitat outside the protected areas. 
Seizing the importation of large animal trophies from Zimbabwe will not contribute in any way to the conservation of ecosystem. Therefore, the proposed SISU Act is completely out of touch with the realities, fundamental realities of sustainable conservation of Thank elephants. you, Doctor. We're going to have Thank to you. leave it at that. You'll, you'll certainly have more opportunity to elaborate in the question portion, and, and your full written statement will be made uh, part of the record. So uh, I now recognize myself uh, for five minutes. And uh, I, in, I enjoyed the ranking member's opening statement. Uh, it was very thoughtful, but I found myself pushing back against one part of it, uh, and that was this notion that um, the answer to concerns about extinction and wildlife conservation is this simple notion of assigning a value uh, to the consumption or the killing uh, of a particular species. Um, I think at best that is a double-edged sword because I immediately think about the times when value existed in a big way uh, for the consumption or killing uh, of certain animals and uh, things didn't go so well. I think about the market hunters at the turn of the previous century who uh, certainly saw the value in killing migratory birds, uh, but that's what forced us to organize the modern conservation movement as Teddy Roosevelt and others realized that we were on a path to extinction uh, for many, many iconic species. Uh, we've learned that lesson over and over again, that value plus greed or corruption or lack of enforceable rules or institutions that we can count on uh, is really uh, a road to disaster, whether it's shark finning or market hunters and migratory birds or some of the iconic uh, endangered and threatened animals we're talking about here today. But I want to start by talking about this idea of dollar value as a conservation Tool and Dr. Packer, um, uh, some of these animals, uh, the value seems a little low that's been assigned to trophy hunters. When you consider their the conservation status, the sheer cost of maintaining some of these uh, wildlife refuges with very little support from government. So let me invite you to speak about this. Are the fees that trophy hunters currently pay enough to justify killing the animals? And can you elaborate, you know, if we are going to rely on this tool of valuing the consumption or killing, uh, what's what's a realistic value? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I, that's an excellent question, and I am forever amazed at how low the trophy fees are for lions. Uh, Zambia, for example, the trophy fee for a lion is less than twelve thousand dollars. And I know that in North America, uh, in some of our states, that when we have hunting f uh, tickets uh, for, say, bighorn sheep. Uh, those prices be far higher, and those are for sheep. And with lions, they're about as rare now as rhino. So the, the reason for the price being so extraordinarily low, I think, is to some extent a legacy of the kind of, well, in, in some countries, the, the wildlife authorities are meant to be regulating the industry, but the local, local culture would say it's the industry is regulating the, com the, com the country's wildlife authorities. And so partly there's been competition between countries. So if Tanzania threatens to raise its hunting fees to 25,000, then the hunters will say, oh no, Botswana, their, their prices are lower. So that's part of it is competition between countries and the history of very close ties between the industry and the regulators that are meant to get the money for the country, but often it doesn't go to the country but to the regulator as an individual instead. The other problem in particular for lions is the canned hunting industry in South Africa because it's easy to farm a lion if you have private property and access to an abattoir. You get horse meat and leftover beef that's not suitable for human consumption. and You don't have to pay those costs. You don't have to pay for an anti-poaching crew, you don't have to pay for community relationships. And so there's literally factory farming of lions, and that price is known to the hunting public. So when individuals are going to decide where are we going to go on our hunting safari, if all they're interested in is the trophy per se, right. there there's other types of value. Uh, Dr. McCono talked about, well, and actually Ms. Ho talked about the value Cecil the lion had for people to simply come and see him over and over again. That value was extinguished uh, with the killing of that particular animal, correct? Yes, so that the, the tourist value for the, the non-consumptive side certainly is never calculated in that at yeah. all. 
Ms. Pepper, I want to ask you about this controversial advisory committee the administration has set up. Um, is there enough peer-reviewed data and scientific evidence to legally justify having an advisory committee whose mission it is to promote trophy hunting? And uh, how would having wildlife biologists on this committee uh, improve the current dialogue? Uh, no, I don't think there is enough peer-reviewed data being looked at by um, by this council. Um, I think the presence of conservation biologists on the council would really improve the dialogue. It would create, you know, informed science-based contributions that would allow objective decision-making regarding whether any offtake of a species was sustainable. Um, you know, these scientists are trained to look at population data, species characteristics such as reproduction and the effects of climate change and habitat loss on a species and make a decision about whether offtake is sustainable based on those factors, um, which really stands in stark contrast to the current um, council members who can't make objective decisions because they have direct financial interest in reducing Thank protection. you. I'm sorry I didn't allow enough time to, to really do justice to this subject, but uh, I'm out of time. I'll now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Pepper, how long have you lived in Zimbabwe? Zero years. Oh, well, neither have I, but uh, Dr. Gandiwa, uh, you've lived in Zimbabwe your, pretty much your whole life, right? That's correct. Uh, you have a PhD in environmental science, science and paleontology from Commonwealth University and the University of KwaZulu-Natal, is that correct? That is correct. I've got uh, your CV here. 16 pages long, filled with hundreds of peer-reviewed articles and scientific presentations on conservation of these animals. Is that a semi-complete list anyway? It's of your not, work? It's not a complete list. What I'd like to know, I'm kind of curious as to how you feel having this panel of so-called experts lecture you over what's in your country's best interests. Thank you. Uh, it feels very disturbing because there is a very clear um, distinction between someone who has actually lived in the area and being part of the socio-ecological system versus to someone who just visits an area to do a study. The depth of understanding of the issues of what is working is certainly uh, the difference. And uh, I can only reflect that also to the fact that uh, when you see those countries who are very restrictive on uh, uh, sustainable utilization up in West, Central, and East Africa, their populations crashed. But when you look at our region, Southern Africa, and Zimbabwe in particular, the reason why our populations are doing so well is the principles in our philosophy of conservation, which is based well, on... Well, well, that can't possibly be right, because we were just told that your entire approach is completely unscientific, it's, it's motivated by greed, corruption, and bloodlust. I can say our systems, like anywhere else, are not perfect. But certainly, this bill is not answering the... It's not answering the, the, it's not related to the challenges that we might be facing at hand. And there's no science uh, that is informing this bill. Yet there's a rhetoric, global rhetoric, that our policy decisions should be informed by science. And where is the science in the CISO Act? Zero. There's nothing. But we can demonstrate uh, to you here. I brought with me uh, the documents demonstrating what trophy hunting is actually contributing to conservation in Zimbabwe. And, and in addition to your extensive scientific background, and you must be one of the leading experts on this front, just looking at this, the volume of work you've you, you produced during your, your career so far, you're also uh, the executive technical advisor for the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority, and have come here today to speak on behalf of the government and people of Zimbabwe. Um, I'm just wondering, in, in the final two minutes I have, could you tell us this bill is, is, is adopted into law. What does that do to Zimbabwe, its economy, as well as its ability to, to protect its natural resources? Th thank you very much for that question. What it will do, what this bill will do, it will certainly, 
it will certainly give us an inability to implement our fantastic management plan for elephants that I have with me here, which I've submitted to the committee as evidence. It will jeopardize our, our efforts to implement even our community-based natural resources management program in our reviewed CBNRM policy framework that I brought with me here. And it will also compromise implementing our strategic, five-year strategic plan for 2019 to 2023 that I've brought with me here as evidence to the committee. And even our Lion strategic management plan that I've brought with me here, all these efforts, because we are not funded by the national fiscals, we will be very much, we will have huge shortfalls in our conservation framework, and also even doing area survey for the same species that people are very curious to know how many we have. There is actually an example of area management, uh, area survey for the Gonorrhea National Park with a ballooning population for last year. Yet when we ask for resources, we don't get the resources. When we want to utilize our resources, there is a don't touch approach. So what do we do? Where do, we get the resource, where do we get the resources to do effective management? It will really jeopardize even all the investment that the American people did. Dr. Gandewa, you are shaking my confidence in, in the fact that we know so much better how to manage your country's affairs than, than you do. Um, let me just ask you one more question. If any of the, these species, uh, African lions, African uh, uh, elephants, were hunted to extinction, would that be devastating to your country? Um, that would be devastating, but so, I don't... So, so my, my, my point is, no one has a greater incentive to preserve the habitats and the populations of these animals than the people and government of Zimbabwe. Is that correct? That is correct. Great. Thank you. The chair now recognizes uh, Chairman Grijalva for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Bacono, uh, how much of a role does... Uh, U.S. play in global trophy hunting and like the law we're discussing today, the CISA law, what is the United States' responsibility to pass laws like that, like the CISA Act? Yes. Uh, my, my understanding is that uh, the United States is in the top five countries um, uh, where hunters come from. And um, my understanding also is that uh, along with countries like Australia, the United, uh, uh, France, and, and the like, uh, actions taken um, by the United States um, have very persuasive uh, significance for how the world engages with, with this debate. And um, as you might know, Australia has already moved to ban uh, the importation of lion trophies. France has done the same. Netherlands has done the same. So countries that are, that are kindred spirits um, to the United States have, have already uh, stopped the importation of lion trophies because uh, the data does demonstrate that um, our numbers okay. have drastically fallen. So, so, so my view is that um, uh, the United States should um, uh, follow suit as has be, uh, to what has been done by, um, by countries that have similar values. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ho, you, can you explain, the, I think, the, an important difference, the key differences between importing trophy, animal trophies on a nation-by-nation -nation basis rather than a case-by-case -case basis, uh, as the administration has decided? Uh, what are some of the consequences to that? And also, as part of that, is uh, with this new method uh, that the administration, is there enough transparency for the public to tell whether a species is being conserved or not. While I can appreciate some of the merits of a case-by-case -case approach, I think it might be problematic in the sense that uh, it might result in rather arbitrary decisions uh, as opposed to decisions that have consistency to them uh, where uh, United States citizens and the world at large have a, a clear sense of what the position of the United States is. So my, my fear is that case-by-case um, -case approaches uh, in effect will tend to produce very ab arbitrary uh, actions. Uh, 
Um, and, and thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Guhava, for the questions. And I agree with uh, Dr. McCono that um, since March 1st, 2018, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has decided to uh, decide on uh, trophy import decisions on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. And essentially, they are making these important conservation decisions uh, behind uh, closed doors, uh, shielding the public from any opportunity to provide input, uh, including that uh, from ind independent scientists. Um, and, and these decisions, uh, as I said in my earlier testimony, are of great interest uh, to the majority of, of the American public. 80% of them, including uh, Republicans and Democrats, oppose the importation of lion and hunting trophies. Um, and it is within the agency's uh, statutory duties and also legal obligation under the ESA as well as Freedom of Information Act to provide real-time information on the applications, uh, permits, uh, permit importation, uh, importations, and also enhance and mind, uh, enhancement findings to ensure that these uh, decisions are based on science, uh, are comprehensive, and, um, and also include uh, the public input, including that of independent scientists. You know, Dr. Parker, whatever time I have left, the, the, the role, if you can, you can comment on that. The role that corruption plays in, and we've heard it uh, twice today from two witnesses, plays in the management of a trophy hunted species. Uh, corruption has been implicated both in the field, where uh, hunters are often uh, out trying to obtain a trophy, and it may not be the, the first animal that they shoot, may not be the most beautiful specimen, so maybe it a, a, a better specimen is found later, and so a second animal is shot on the same license. Also, where the, the animal is shot may not be reported accurately. So those things happen in the field. Uh, and then uh, there are currently supposed to be limits on the age that a lion can be shot. If it's too young, that's likely to be too disruptive to the population. And there's no way of knowing whether there's any kind of um, payments being made to allow underage animals to get through. The bigger issue has been block allocation in the past, so that friends of the friends of the people in the government are able to get access to the hunting blocks at a very low price, which is part of why the, everything is underfunded, is that there hasn't been an adequate uh, financial assessment to how much these areas are really worth, and then obtaining that much money to cover the true cost of conserving them. Thank you, Doctor. Thank We're you. Back, sir. Thank we'll, you. we'll have to leave it there. Uh, the chair will go to Mr. Graves for what will probably be our final um, questioning. Uh, we will then um, recess and un we'll be unlikely to adjourn, frankly, because these are last votes of the day and I don't think we're gonna get members back, so maybe we will just adjourn after Mr. Graves. Before we do that, I would like to request unanimous consent. I, I don't mean to be too provocative about this, but in light of the, the questioning with uh, the witness from the Republic of Zimbabwe, uh, I ask unanimous consent to enter um, a report from Transparency International from 2018, which examined corruption in uh, 180 countries. Uh, that report shows Zimbabwe uh, near the bottom uh, in terms of the corruption index. Uh, so I'll ask unanimous consent to enter that in the record. Mr. Chairman, I'd also ask unanimous consent to submit the following documents in the hearing record, letters from the African nations of Tanzania, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, calling on the United States uh, to consider the detrimental effects banning certain wildlife imports uh, would have on their wildlife conservation goals. Letters from local organizations in the country of Namibia uh, expressing severe concern with the ban on trophy imports and exports uh, uh, would, this bill would have on their communities. Multiple letters and statements in opposition to legislation under consideration from conservation groups, including uh, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, Safari Club International, Dallas Safari Club, mm -hmm. Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, and many others. A letter addressed to Chairman Grijalva and Ranking Member Bishop uh, and myself from the International Union for Conservation of Nature expressing concerns that the bill is not based on meaningful and equitable consultation with uh, a range of state governments and indigenous peoples uh, and uh, other support documents that underscore the conservation benefits of lawful big game hunting. Without objection, that was good fast talking. You should do those disclaimers at the end of pharmaceutical advertisements. Uh, and then just one more unanimous consent, uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record a tweet by President Trump dated November 19th, 2017, which characterizes trophy hunting of ele elephants and other animals as a, quote, horror show. So uh, without objection, all of that will be entered into the record. We'll now recognize Mr. Graves for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here, particularly Dr. Makono, and I apologize if I mispronounced that, and, and Ms. Uh, Gandiwa, I know that um, extensive travel in order for you to be here. I appreciate the sacrifice that you've made today. Um, uh, Ms. Gandiwa, just, just quick yes or no. If, if this bill were to come law, would it stop hunting in, in uh, your country? It will not stop hunting in my country. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Semser, um, a, a few questions. So, so you note in your testimony that the, the population of Africa is expected to just surge and that I think you said that um, nearly one half of the world's population growth is going to occur on the African continent over the next 30 years. These areas, uh, regardless of your perspective of what actually happens in regard to the hunting or not hunting, this is conserving the land. And without these, these uh, uh, facilities being there, uh, I expect with population growth, there's threat of development of, of these areas. Would you agree? I would agree, and I think we're already starting to see that happen in national parks in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, and uh, Ghana. Destroying habitat. I'm sorry. Destroying habitat. Uh, these nations that are subjected to the bill, um, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, um, the, the, um, and Zambia, they, they're, they're, as well as the U.S., they are signatories to the CITES Convention, correct? They are. How, under the obligations of the convention, what obligation do member states have to have dialogue with one another related to actions that a, a, a signatory country may take that would adversely affect the conservation objectives of others? Does, does that question make sense? It does, and I'm not an attorney, so I can be happy. I'd be happy to get you an uh, not, not an attorney in spokesperson. Uh, but um, yeah. you know, CITES does require, as a multilateral agreement, that parties do consult with one another. And I think we have to ask the question of of what value is added bureaucracy in the United States above and beyond the CITES process. And if it does provide value, also what is the value of the United States second guessing its African partners? or also party to the CITES process. So, so Mr. Chairman, we've just established that one, the, the bill's not gonna result in, in, in the, the elimination of hunting, and I would argue that if, if this bill were to become law and if every other country were to enact similar laws, then you, you're, you're not gonna have a, 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 you're not gonna stop hunting. You're, you're probably gonna increase illegal, illegal hunting or poaching that would, would occur to some degree. I think we've got to be very careful at looking at the revenue that is generated under this uh, program, uh, under the, the, the hunting programs. Will the gentleman look, yield? Look at the, in, in just a minute, look at the fact that the revenue that's generated um, actually is invested back into the campfire program and other programs that actually benefit the species, that benefit the communities, and also help to address the population health or the management of these species. Um, I mean, Mr. Chairman, you and I have had great dialogue on red snapper and other, other species at home. Are we uh, calling that great? <laughs> oh, they've been fantastic and has. Um, um, and and I, I just think it's important that we recognize, you know, look, I'm not a big game hunter, but, but it is a management tool in this case that, that actually adds to conservation activities. And I'd be, I can't wait to hear what you oh, have to say. No, it's just the gentleman's question suggested that, that you thought perhaps the objective of the bill was to ban hunting in these countries. And I just want to clarify, it's not. This bill doesn't, doesn't try to ban hunting at all. So it's, it's not... Not news that it would not end hunting. Sure, and and uh, thank you. And, and reclaiming time, um, I understand that 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 you could make that suggestion, but I think that ultimately it would have a substantial impact on on the industry, um, on the activities there, which then does have a substantial impact on the objectives of the campfire program, on conservation activities, and on population health. And look, let's be clear: if this program is run properly, and 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 I take note about the. Um, coming from Louisiana, it's important to note that every country and state can't be quite as ethical and, and as progressive as we are, but... Um, How many governors are in prison? <laughs> hey, you know what? Details, Mr. Mr. Chairman, details. Because um, <laughs> actually our last governor, he's out of prison. He's been released. You know, I'm offended. 
Um, but, 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 it, but it is important to note that this does provide resources for uh, the, the, the conservation managers, for the resource managers to be able to invest back into population programs, back into the economy that, that does lift, I think, the lives of, of uh, many citizens of the, of the country. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Gandiva, could you just pontificate quickly on the campfire program and, and talk a little bit about what would happen if, if these activities were ceased in your country? The communal areas management program for indigenous resources campfire from Zimbabwe, the program will be negatively impacted and it will be really unfortunate because the American people through USAID uh, contributed significantly in the establishment of this uh, flagship initiative. And uh, from the five million uh, in ranging revenue that I mentioned in my statement, approximately two million actually goes directly to local communities. And I have a document with me here with bank statements, which will show you what exactly specific activities and initiatives will be, will be affected and will risk losing wildlife habitat, of which the greatest amount of wildlife habitat, for example, in Zimbabwe, about five million hectares lies in the communal areas. And what benefit will it be there for local communities to conserve wildlife habitat when the economic value of such wildlife that is roaming free and wild in their areas is removed. Doctor, I, thank you for your time. We're going to have to leave it at that. And, and Ms. Chair, I just want to ask unanimous consent to include uh, the document she referenced in the, in the record just to help us see the benefits of the campaign. Without objection, we will do it. Always uh, good to have Mr. Graves give the final word. And uh, with that, uh, this, this hearing uh, is now wrapping up. I'm going to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony. Thank the members for their questions. This mem uh, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for some of you, and we'll ask you to respond to those in writing under the committee rules. Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit written questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will then be held open for 10 business days uh, for your responses. If there's no further business, without objection, uh, we stand adjourned.